welcome once again to another episode of This Is Metal with Joe Lawson. Tonight, Joe, we're going to be talking all about John Karabi. We talked um, several times about uh, John Karabi in many of the uh, past episodes, um, especially in the Motley Crue episode. But we thought, um, you know, we're such a fan of everything he's done that he deserved um, an episode dedicated 100% to everything he's done throughout his entire career. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, what, a, what a worthy... Uh Worthy subject matter to, to do a, a show on uh, an individual. Yeah, and, and you know, um, let's get right into it, Joe, because um, like I said, I know um, you're a huge Karabi fan. As am I, um, why don't we start the show off? You tell us um, once again how you um, first discovered Mr. Karabi or um, how he came on your radar. Well, um, like a lot of uh, kids back in the day, you know, I found out about a lot of bands through either magazines or uh, just going and hanging out in the record stores, you know, and picking a cover and picking something that I thought looked cool or sound like it might sound cool yeah. or, you and, know, whatever I heard from my friends. And a lot of people listening to this. I picked that up in yeah. uh, 92 or 93, wow. and I thought, this sounds pretty cool, you know, the screen. Yeah, and a lot of people and maybe... the original copies. Yeah, a lot of so people... it was really cool, really cool and really rare. And yeah. uh, I brought it home and listened to it and just totally loved it and to this day all these years later i still really love that record it's, it's there's something unique and special about it it's really awesome and uh that's how i was originally introduced to who john karabi was you know in the band the scream you know so that was my that was my first introduction to uh to john karabi yeah, and i love that because um you know my story is a little different like a lot of people i first discovered uh, john karabi um when it was announced he was the new lead singer in um, Motley Crue. Unlike you, Joe, I, I kind of discovered that great Scream album, you know, um, after the fact. But um, the thing I will say is um, anybody that brings up a John Karabi, they always talk about what a great album that Scream, Scream album was. And, and it's amazing when you talk about it because the Scream is a band that kind of, you know, just had the one album. And yet that is considered all these years later, that's considered like a... A classic album, you know, um, in his repertoire. I mean, um, people probably bring up that album and maybe, um, maybe obviously the Motley Crue one. But um, everything that guy does, see, that's the thing with Karabi, is um, ever since I first heard him on that Motley Crue album, anything I, that he's ever been part of, I, I know before I buy it, I'm going to love it. You know, anything that's got Karabi, it's, I know it's going to be good. Exactly. I, I, I uh, completely reiterate and, con and, and cooperate that statement love love the uh, love the band love the, the music that he's involved in I haven't heard anything that i thought sucked nothing and um actually a lot of people don't know this uh, but the scream recorded a follow-up album in 1993 called taking it to the next level it was never released and to this day john karabi and the remaining uh members of the screen uh, cannot get Hollywood records to release this they will not give it to the band and they will not and they will not release it so John's John's been telling them well at least put it out on iTunes or something yeah, you know, yeah. make it available make this stuff available he's got a bunch of stuff that he's done it's just sitting on a shelf collecting dust and because record labels own it he can't do anything with it yeah and, and the scream is one of those bands too but besides uh, John Karabi at one point um Scott Travis was the drummer um, in that band briefly um, before he was in Judas Priest. Um, and then they had um, Bruce Bollier was supposed to be like a, a top-notch um, guitar shredder type of guy. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's one of those albums people say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, probably the first thing John Karabi, people are going to know John Karabi from. And then he's got all these other guys that are in the band. But um, like one of my favorite songs off that Scream album, it's kind of, um, it, it's about what I, I, I guess you call a ballad, power ballad. Um, Father, mother, son. Um, that that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a, a cool song. That's a great tune, and um, just everything on there. There's a little bit of everything, and you know, um, the thing I love when he joined Motley Crue, of course, like I said, that's when I discovered him for the first time. And I went, um, unlike a lot of people, I said, you know, I'm going to be fair. I'm going to listen to this before I decide I don't like it. And and yeah. and much to my amazement, I said, you know what, this isn't Vince Neil, but. But I'm digging the sounds coming off this album. And um, I remember at the time, you know, Nikki and all the other guys in the band were really propping John up. In fact, I remember Nikki 
you know, going on MTV News or something and saying like to the effect that, yeah, you know, this, this, this is Motley Crue. We're making a bold statement. That's why we're calling the album Motley Crue. It's just that good. And then Tommy Lee was yeah, all like... Yeah, you know, you, you know the thing that just really yeah. irritates the living shit out of me is that, you know, I, I mean, people say things that they don't mean yeah, yeah. And, and in the heat of the moment. And, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so there's probably a ton of shit that we don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but that being said, what fans do know is some of the negative things that Nikki's came out and said about John after the fact. Yeah. And what makes him look like a hypocrite and a total douchebag is you're going to say that John didn't know how to write songs or you had to teach him how to write songs or whatever bullshit you thought. Yeah. Okay? And then you turn around and you take some of the songs that John wrote and co-wrote and you release an album, Generation Swine, with uh, Vince Pitt, Squeal Neal yeah. singing it. Yeah, yeah. And it's good enough to call that Motley Crue, but you're going to say that John didn't know how to write songs. But you're going to use the songs that John co-wrote or wrote. Yeah, well, you know... Um, um, it, it's, just a total, it's just total hypocrisy. Well, yeah, you know, and in prepping for this, I, I listened to an uh, interview John did... Um, I forget where where it was, but anyways, he was saying some of the, along those lines, and he was he was mentioning the fact that um, you know that Motley Crue album, um, as, as much as a lot of the fans you know um, love it, that's the one album um, that and, and New Tattoo, which is the album they did with Randy Castillo on drums. Um, you know, um, he said for whatever reason, when Motley Crue um, re released their catalog of music, they decided not to re release those two albums. Karabi's like, I, I don't know why. You know, even. Randy Castillo, you know, may he rest in peace. Um, for some, I guess because it doesn't feature an original um, lineup, they don't want to... Right, they have a narrative that they're trying to push and keep, and they don't want to They don't want to recognize that era, you know, because they, they look at that era as not being as successful, and they can't ride the nostalgia wave factor, you know, and there's a lot of bands actually that are doing that. Judas Priest does that, I mean, to some degree, and Iron Maiden does yeah. that to some degree, yeah. with the Blaze Bailey stuff and the Ripper Owens stuff. You know, you don't see Rob Halford and uh, Judas Priest going out singing uh, songs from Jugulator on tour. I mean, see, see that's... And you that's, probably won't see that. And that is true, but but I, I do think, you know, I, I don't understand why, um, I, I guess financially maybe, but... Um, I don't know why all of a sudden you'd kind of like dump on an album you put out that you once thought was so. Um... Well, John, John put it put it really good, you know, and and it blew me away to hear him say recently that to this day, John Karabi still gets hate mail from people. Oh yeah, oh, saying yeah. you're you're not Mo you're not Motley Crue and you're not Vince. Uh, Vince is Motley Crue and you suck and all this fucked up shit. And he's like, look, he, he, he wrote one dude back and told him, listen, dude, and he said. If the, one of the biggest rock bands in the world were just to give you a, a job offer and call you up, what would you do? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you, a, a career change, a life change, in fact, changing opportunity. Yeah. In fact, I think. Would you, would you seriously yeah. not give it a shot? Yeah. In fact, I think I've seen the same. You know, and and yeah. that's not, you know, and like he said, like he said, it wasn't like they were. Re he was rehearsing with Motley Crue behind Vince Neil's back. Yeah. They had fired Vince Neil before John even came into the picture. Yeah, and you know, um, I think I, I I was listening to that same interview, and um, he was telling a story at the beginning of the interview where um, he's talking about like when they first went on that Motley Crue tour in '94 after the album came out. He said, "There was this—I forget what uh, you know what state it was." But he says, "There's this guy to show New York." New York, and he said, yeah. this, "This guy was like um, he spit at Nikki, and he was like just in the in the audience, kind of really you know heckling heckling the band." And he says, "I I, I, I school with it. I kind of understand." He says, "But he said at one point the guy spits at Nikki, and and then he goes just all hell breaks loose." And and um, he says years later, he he gets interviewed by the same guy, and the guy was telling him, "Hey, you don't remember me, do you?" And and then you know he realized, oh yeah, it's the guy, and he says, "Man, I want to just apologize and um, say I'm so sorry. I was a stupid jerk back then, and this and that." But in a way, it's a cool story because it shows you that um, what a cool guy John is that he could have it in and to kind of forgive that guy, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, uh, everybody's 
everybody's guilty of maybe jumping to conclusions or, yeah, yeah, or yeah. making rash decisions. I mean, that, that's human nature, and it's going to happen, yeah. you know, to some degree. Some people take it a little further than others, but, you know, it is what it is, and uh, people are passionate about their favorite bands and, and things like this. But, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, that, that's unfortunate that people got to, uh, you know, 25, 30 years later, hate on him. That's something else that I didn't realize, that John was actually in Motley Crue for five years. I didn't realize it was that long of a time, but he yeah. said, that's what he said, five years. And uh, they did the one album, of course, and then Courtenary, uh, you know, the leftover songs that yeah, they yeah, did yeah. that didn't make the album the same year. And then he wrote or co-wrote a bunch of uh, stuff that was on, that was they used on Generation Swine. Now, now, what's interesting is, okay, um, the coordinary thing was like a little, um, I think it was like a five or six song EP, and where each of the band members like had a solo track, and um, and Tommy did a vocal track, Nikki did a vocal track, John did his own kind of solo vocal track, and then they did a, tr they did like all five, all four guys together did had a track, and then like Mick, Mick Mars did an instrumental track, um, but but it's a cool little thing that was originally just available like in. Um, Japan. Now, going back to the Motley Crue album that featured John, I don't know if um, you ever heard the song Uncle Jack. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, of course. And, and of course, if anybody doesn't know, um, I've heard John talk over years that that song was actually based on um, his, uh, his, his uncle. His uncle. Uh, uh, it was a child, family, yeah. child molester, and he's like, that's kind of what that's about. You know, growing up yeah. and kind of knowing you got a guy like that um, in your family. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's got a he's got a pretty crazy past, man. I mean, as uh, his upbringing and everything else. And uh, speaking on that, I suppose that's a good segue to mention uh, John's new book uh, yeah. coming out in uh, June 2022 um, on his website, johncarabi.com, Horseshoes and Hand Grenades. You can go. I've seen today they pre posted pre-orders are available now, yeah. so you can get this also as of uh, gatefold vinyl. Uh, standard black vinyl or uh, uh, limited edition orange black gold splatter vinyl uh, that uh, goes through and does an audio version of it and gives you uh, audio audiobook samples, instrumental mixes, and different things that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. Um, that's uh, in regards to his book and uh, the music that he's been involved with. So um, that's on his uh, website, Horseshoes and Hand Grenades. Uh, Pre-order available now. How cool is that, you know, and um, another thing that you and I were in prepping for a show, Joe, the other day we were talking about is um, the Dead Daisies, which is another band he was recently in um, for about four or five years, and he's done, he did two studio albums with them, he did a, a full-length uh, live album, and, and the interesting thing about the Dead Daisies is um, the, the main guy, David Lowry, he's a rhythm guitar player, but it's, it's basically his band, and he... he um, he, he basically hires like kind of name name guys um, to play in the band with him, and um, he's he's originally from Australia. He's cut, like a, cut, cut, cut. Hang yeah. on a minute. What? You just you just skipped like ten years of the dude's musical background. Are we gonna jump to the Dead Daisies without even mentioning Rat and Twenty Four Seven and all these other projects? I'll let you take I, it. I'm, I'm just kidding you. I, I just wanted to throw that in there for some for some fun reason. Yeah, I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to remember everything. But um, but I, I okay. Yeah, so there's a lot. There's a lot. It's crazy how much this guy's been involved with, and the bands and the people that he's worked with is quite a, getting to be quite a long list. Yeah, I, I will. I will say. I, yeah, let's try to keep it chronological. Uh, thanks for uh, redirecting me there, Joe. But but um. Oh, I'm just I'm just messing. With but, you. but I do it's think fun. I do think um. <laughs> We got to mention Union. That was one of my favorite bands he was in, and that, of course, is right after um, Motley Crue. That's the thing, band he had with um, Bruce Kulick, and um, the, the debut album um, came out in '98. Great, great stuff. Like everything John has done, um, him and Bruce had a great chemistry. That band also featured um, the uh, drummer Brent Fence, who's of course Slash's drummer now. Um, great, great band. Unfortunately, like a lot of bands at the time, um, you know, they they put out two albums, uh, and then the the record company kind of folded and everything kind of just um, went to pot. But, you know, there's always these rumors of a union reunion. I mean, um, even, even something like that where there's only two albums worth, um, fans are still dying, you know, just the thought of him getting back t together with those guys. Yeah, yeah, you know, and Union is the one project, as far as I can tell, that uh, 
John ended things with all the guys on, the, on good terms, and uh, there was no, there was nothing, uh, no harsh final moments, and they never really split up as a band. So this is something that could resurface again. I mean, uh, with the lack of touring and COVID shutting everything down yeah. all, all over the place and the uncertainty of, of a touring schedule, it leaves more time and uh, availability uh, for writing and recording for our, for musicians. So, you know, there could be another union record. And I did find out today also that both union albums are going to be released on vinyl yeah, for yeah. the first time. Yeah, yeah. So this is something uh, that takes a while. It doesn't happen overnight. And, um, you know, I'm sure if you stay tuned to uh, post it to johncarabi.com, you'll find out you know, when those are available, I'm sure he'll let everybody know when there's any kind of pre-order information on that. But, uh, and interestingly enough, Bruce Kulik went on to play with Grand Funk Railroad. Yeah, and, and see, see, the thing with that, too, is um, that's around, you know, around the time Union folded, um, Bruce got the gig with Grand Funk, and of course, uh, I mean, that's a much higher profile gig, and then John got the gig as a um, rhythm guitar player in um, Rad, and what's, what's amazing about that is, again, initially... Um, when I heard that, I thought, "Oh man, a, a guy that can, you know, that can uh, sing as great as Karabi. What's he doing, um, you know, in Rat as a rhythm guitar player?" But, but I get it, you know, um, you know, maybe it was a fact of needing to pay the bills, and okay, that's the only gig I can get right now. But hey, it's a good paying gig. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. And, and I mean, again, I could, I could see. Okay, um, at that point, Stephen Piercey's back in Rat. It's his band. Um, but I, I thought too. Hey, would have been cool if, um, you know. That they had where Steven and John were both um, kind of doing lead vocals, but I, I, I get it. It's Steven's band, you know. So um, I thought even even for the time with that, it was it was a cool thing. But um, John also recently went on the record um, in some of his recent interviews talking about the fact that he got along with all the rat guys. He said the problem was like um, the original guys in the band, uh, um, you know, Warren, Bobby, and Steven. He's like he goes those guys they hate each other. They were constantly arguing and fighting. He goes I. He goes, I, I love being part of a band, but, you know, all the arguing and fighting just got to be too much. <laughs> with, right, right. With the other guys, you know. Um, and he's like, you know, they'd be, like, backstage fighting or whatever before, before or after a concert, and him and, you know, him and the other guys are kind of just the hired guns. They're just kind of um, keeping quiet and watching what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, then uh, he went on to uh, participate in a project called 24-7 with rat drummer Bobby Blotzer. And uh, thanks to you, I uh, listened to some of that yeah. today, actually. And, um, I mean, for the time, I guess it sounded cool. It, it, it had a real 80s flavor to it. Yeah. But, you know, in all, if I'm honest, if I'm totally honest yeah. here, it, it was a little bit too bubblegumish for me. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, and, and I don't mean that in a, in a really derogatory, negative way. That's just my personal taste. And, uh, you know, I, I like uh, the other stuff that he did a lot more. Yeah. You know, uh, that's one of my, eh, you know, kind of, it's decent, you know, it doesn't suck. But I, yeah, what, and what I know about that, Joe, is um, the, the reason that... Destination everywhere. Yeah, the, right? yeah. The, the reason the reason that project kind of fell apart again, um, Bobby Blotcher. From what I understand, that was initially um, Bobby Blotcher kind of got signed to a solo deal, and that was his his little project. And um, and then he didn't like the little deal he got with the whatever um, whoever put that out, you know, initially. And um, and he told him, you know what, if you're not gonna um, promote this album or let me do do it the way I want to do it, just 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 drop the album. And and then what he ended up doing was. Um, he would go, he went and um, he, he, he formed his band with Janie Lane and I think Robbie Crane also who was in Rat at one point as a bass player. Um, and they had this project called um, The Underground Saints. And some of that 24-7 material ended up on that album. They did like um, with these different guys and it was called The Underground Saints. So um, a lot of that material kind of um, got released in different versions over the years. Gotcha, gotcha. Now have, have you ever seen John live? Um, well, um, not known. I, I've never, oh, actually, no, no, I, actually I did. Um, you know, when, um, can't believe I forgot this, but yeah, um, on, on the Motley Crue tour, actually, um, I seen, I forget where it was they played, but it was, it was like a little club, um, somewhere in Hollywood and, um, and, but, but I went also not just to see Motley Crue because the opening act, if you could believe it or not, um, again, this is 94, was Gilby Clark. He had just, he had just left Guns N' Roses and put out his first. Nice. 
first, yeah. put out his first solo album. I thought, what what a great little bill. And yeah, I I, um, I thought for Molly Crew what it was. It was a cool show. Of course, it, it's not the same thing as seeing them in an arena, but it was kind of really, um, you know, really slick down, and it was it was different on that point on that aspect. But um, I, I dug it, and, and you know, and Nikki was kind of um, trying to look like a punk at the time. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I uh, my first experience was uh, ninety eight. I saw him out west. I was uh, living in Arizona at the time, and I seen him with Union. Oh wow! And uh, that's that was a really cool cool thing too. I got to hang out and talk to him a little bit, and um, that's where I first actually met met him. And then years later, um, a friend of mine, uh, fast forward to uh, like 2012 or 14, something like that, he uh, was playing some small clubs. And I went on a, he was doing an acoustic tour, and I went and uh, to, the, to the small club. And I was sitting at a table with a group of friends, and they were asking me, well, you know, you met him, what's, what's he like and stuff? And I said, well, it's real down to earth, you know, and, and you know, if he knows, he probably just, pull up a chair and sit down right next to you. And I, I turn around, somebody's standing there, and he, he pulls up a chair, sits right down next to me, right as I, right after I said that, and goes, hey, what's up, how you doing? I was just like, wow, how long have you been standing there? And he said, long enough. <laughs> yeah, in fact, Joe, I think I shared with you um, not too long ago that um, I had the chance over the years to interview John twice, you know, over the phone, um, like like what we're doing here. and. Um, Super nice guy, really uh, down to earth. I mean, um, even though I'm just talking to the guy over the phone, I mean, I felt like he was an old friend. He, he was that down to earth. And, and the thing about it was, is um, first time I interviewed him was for his um, first solo album, the Unplugged album. And um, you know, we're, we're we're talking about that. The second time it was for um, it was for the Dead Daisies. And um, all I can just say is, um, you know, I found him to be really a super cool guy. In effect, um, you know, and, I, and, and I feel sorry for yeah. him and and other musicians too. During this time, you know, um, this is how these guys make their living. It's yeah, not yeah. Just a hobby. It's not something they do for fun. If they don't do this, they don't pay their bills. Yeah. So it's a little higher, more higher stakes game for them, and uh, it's really difficult when you got all these tours and all these things lined up, or you think you do, and they keep getting canceled and rescheduled and rebooked and rebooked and you can't go out and play anywhere he's supposed to go to canada he's supposed to go to mexico he's got all this stuff lined up and he can't do it yeah and what i understand is um you know he's originally from philadelphia as we discussed um you know he lived uh, several um years in los angeles and hollywood these days he's living a natural lot like a lot of 80s rockers and um from what i understand um he's got his own studio where he records all his music so he doesn't have to worry about going somewhere and recording but um He's in Nashville these days, and and so that that's a place they call Music City. It's like um, they got every kind of musician and songwriter in there. Um, and he's, from what I understand, he's got his own private like uh, motorhome. When he goes on tour, you know, he takes his motorhome, his his full family. In fact, his his son, who's now grown um, grown up, uh, his son Ian is the drummer in his solo band. Right on. That's awesome. That's what I thought when I seen the when I seen the video. I'm like, I think that's his son. Yeah. In fact, you know, John's kind of doing it the modern way. Like you said, he's a working musician, and so, um, you know, rather than like releasing an album all at once, I guess what he's doing is um, you you see, there's a current single called um, Casabella or something like that. That's his latest solo yeah, single. Yep. And, and um, he and I guess his plan is that he's working on new tunes and he's going to release like a different tune every couple months. You know, every few months or whenever he gets around to it. When he's got enough stuff for a CD, he'll. That's what. That's his plan is to. Um, put it out but he, he's like in no rush and he's kind of doing his thing and, and that's I think for him that's kind of seems to be working you know yeah yeah well you know he, he's on he, he, he's on a um, different path now yeah. you know he, he's had to undertake different things and do things from a different perspective like a lot of musicians you know had to learn how to record learn how to mix learn yeah. how to do all of this learn how to the more that you can do yourself, the better off you are, because the money's not there like it used to be to pay for all this stuff. Yeah, in fact, so musicians yeah. have started have tried have now had to try and build their own studios and learn how to do a lot of this stuff themselves. In fact, going back to the Scream album, um, interestingly enough, um, 
I think the guy that produced that was Eddie Kramer. And if you know anything about music history, he's a guy that's produced um, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, um, Kiss. So can you imagine as John Karabi, you know, your debut album, that you, the first album you ever put out, it's, it's um, produced by a legendary producer like that. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty big. That's pretty awesome, for sure. Yeah. And, and um, you know, uh, he's went on to work with many producers and many professional people since then, too. Of course. So, you know, this, this was like a whole new world uh, for him to have to do, do this stuff and learn things, you know, to, to do things your own way and, and figure out how to, how, to, how to work Pro Tools and all this other stuff. So, um yeah, but uh, he, he's kept at it, as, and uh, I'm glad he has, and so is a, a variety of other musicians that soldiered on. Um, mm-hmm. But getting back to his uh, discography, in 2004, uh, he was part of Brides of Destruction, Here Come the Brides. Now, this sounds like it could have been something really good, but it sounds like egos kind of got, and attitudes got in mm-hmm. the way. He didn't really get along good with Tracy Guns, but Nikki Six and Tracy Guns and John Karabi, I mean, that sounds like a formula that would have been explosive and yeah. uh, really good but um, I could see some uh, egos and attitude issues in that camp so I understand uh, you know why that that one didn't work and out. I think the other reason um, there was an issue besides him not getting along with uh, Tracy is um, they had this other guy London uh, Legrand who was a lead singer for the band and I think uh, John had initially talked to um, Nikki about hey why do you, you know why don't we have like two guys sing you know you have me and London sing and he's like no you know no no uh, you know John and, and this band we're just gonna have one singer and this and that and so initially he was gonna be just a rhythm guitar player or something and I think at that point he kind of um, he wanted to do his own thing he realized he wasn't happy with the direction that the band was going in and, and I guess if you're not happy it makes sense to you know why why stick around but like you said going back to that um first scream album i mean that i mean that's like they say uh, you have your whole life to kind of um you know write those songs and, and and you know to put out your debut album so to speak but but then you know then he gets in motley crew and um he's writing stuff with um you know nikki and um but by the time he gets to union union is um a project he forms with bruce Kulick. It, it's his it's their band, you know, so like John doesn't have to go to Nikki and get permission. Hey, can we put this song out? He, you know, Bruce doesn't have to get permission from Gene or Paul. Hey, hey, can I contribute to the song, right? You know, they, it's like really their first chance to kind of have their own, that, that kind of creative um, control. Like, uh, like, like, let's just go in. We're going to write what we write. And, um, and they, for the first time, both those guys had a lot more um, freedom to just do whatever the hell they want. They, they were like in total control. And I think that's what made that's such a great band, you know? Yeah, right, right. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of a different experience. It's, it's difficult when you come in as a hired gun. And, um, you know, John's done that as well. Yeah. And he's done his own thing. And, you know, so he's, he's kind of been all over with. He's pretty much experienced every possible scenario you probably could experience. He's what I call so, a renaissance you know, mind. I imagine, yeah. you know, at first some of those situations were probably really difficult to navigate and know what to do or know what to say. You know, you, you got to know what, you know, where your place is, and like you said, you know, he's doing this for a living, so, you know, he can only say so much in certain situations, yeah. you know, and um, just kind of uh, ride the wave. So I speak. think I think he's a smart enough guy to know, like, um, you know, like, he's not like a Vinny Vincent that goes in and tries to overplay everybody else. He, he, knows, he knows his place, and he kind of, he kind of uh, does whatever he asks you to fit in, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think he's a, he's a musician's musician. What I mean by that uh, in, in my book is he plays for the song. He doesn't play for his ego or to try and impress anybody with uh, fancy, uh, crazy playing. He plays what he feels really fits the song. You know, he, he works for the song. Yeah, what's interesting is if you saw that interview that, I, that you were talking about that I sent you, um, he talks about the new single, Cal's Bad, So Beautiful, and um, he's saying originally he presented that to the Dead Daisies when he was still with them. And he said, ah, they didn't really care much for, for it. He, like, he, they didn't think it was, um, that it fit their band. And so 
I would have kind of been interested to see um, what they did with it, but um, but but good for him. He he kind of you know he kind of stuck with it. He said, well, if they don't want it. I'll I'll do something with it. Turn it into something. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, that's a good segue, I suppose, for the introduction to John's uh, contribution to the Dead Daisies. Um, now he came into the band in 2015. And he was in the band until uh, 2018, 2019, you know, just before Glenn Hughes uh, came yeah. into the picture. But um, he played on several albums. He toured the entire world, including Russia and uh, Argentina and uh, Mexico. I mean, he was all over the place with these guys. Oh, yeah. So, you know, when I look and I read uh, a little bit of what he accomplished with the Dead Daisies, I dare say that what he did with the Dead Daisies was bigger and more definitely more successful than what he did with Motley Crue. So that's pretty awesome to know that at least he had those years uh, of some really good uh, successful success to build on and new people to meet in the industry and, and things like that, including Brian Tickey. Uh, that, he played drums uh, in Dead Daisies same time John Karabi was in the band. Yeah, Brian Tishy, he's a super, super talented guy. Uh, um, and most people know him as a drummer, of course. I mean, he's played with everybody from um, Whitesnake, Foreigner, Billy Idol. Um, I think I said Whitesnake. Um, super talented guy. He can also play the guitar. I mean, um, like he put on these great Randy Rhodes, um, like tribute shows. Um, as far as, like not just tribute band, but he'd get these other uh, guitar players. They'd get up on stage, they'd... They'd spend a night of paying tribute to Randy, and um, he, he'd organize all these great things. But my point is, so um, while most people know him as drummer, uh, drummer, he 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 writes song. He's a songwriter. Um, he does. He's a very very uh, creative guy. And um, I, I bring Brian Tishy up only because, um, like, I I recently did. I've interviewed him a couple times, but the most recent one was um, for this last Christmas. He he told me a couple of years ago he put out a Christmas CD. It's like an instrumental CD, and um, he does most of the instruments. And it, it's like uh, just rock and Christmas, uh, Christmas music. And um, he was telling me like I really dig um, you know Christmas classics. I didn't want to do like a metal Christmas. I kind of wanted to kind of stay true to these. And then he also plays on. There's an awesome um, Billy Idol Christmas album. If you get a chance to check that out. But um, you know, getting back to John Karabi, like you're saying, when he joins Motley Crue, he's kind of I, I guess what you would consider, or most people anyway would consider, a replacement member. His, his whole thing was. Um, this is the guy uh, replacing Vince Neil. You know, can he can he fill fill those sh huge shoes? Okay, I, I I dare say he did. But by the time he gets to the, what's interesting about the Dead Daisies is um, he's not even the original singer of the Dead Daisies. But the funny thing is, John Karabi joining that band kind of putting put those guys on the map because um, for several years the Dead Daisies they they were huge in um, Australia. Because what what I was saying the uh, uh, rhythm guitar player. Uh, David Lowry, who, um, it's kind of his band. Um, he's from Australia, and he's a multimillionaire, and this is kind of something he did, like, I, I want to put a rock band together, and um, kind of something he does for fun, if you know what I mean. And so, it, uh, but and they had this other guy, John Stevens, who was the original singer, but uh, the Dead Daisies really did not uh, get put on the map as far as in the United States, or become really world successful until Krabi joined. And, and so I, I do think that that's quite a statement right there, you know? Right, I, absolutely. You know, and uh, they went they went on a U.S. tour with Kiss. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's pretty pretty uh, pretty I, good band. You I think know? they even I, I was I was reading they even like um, one year played the Kiss cruise. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I remember that. And and, um, and, and so what's cool is by the time um, John Karabi decides, you know, after one live album and two studio albums to leave the Dead Daisies and kind of concentrate on his solo career full-time um you know um it's you, you think then okay who the hell are they going to get to replace john karabi well they, they they got a guy that's able to do it i mean he he's um quite a legendary singer in his own right glenn hughes you mentioned from deep purple and i'm like um but that you know they had to get a guy at that level to be able to kind of be able to carry on in a successful way and i i think again yeah, that's just yeah that's rock superstar in there right yeah i mean you can't go wrong with glenn hughes but they, I, that, that just says something too to me about what John Karabi brought to that band, that they had to get somebody of Glenn Hughes' caliber in order to kind of even be able to carry on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, everything you said is true. Uh, 
John joining the band really catapulted the success of the Dead Daisies. And if you look at the their albums prior to that, or the stuff that they did prior to that, it's almost like it was non-existent. You know, everything that uh, ended up becoming something big or something on a national and international level was uh, when John, after John joined the band. And um, their albums and their popularity definitely skyrocketed. And they they become a pretty big name, you know. Like I said, they were they were doing tour dates in Italy and France, Croatia, Hungary, Austria, Holland, Belgium, Spain, Japan, Mexico. I mean, they were playing they were playing everywhere. And yeah, it, uh, it, kind of, it kind of makes you think too, because okay, maybe maybe John Karabi leaves, and maybe maybe some people even think, oh, maybe they'll get back with the original singer John Stevens. But see, John Stevens, I think um, you know, outside of Australia, not a, lot, a handful of people, you know, a lot of people don't know. Who, Never heard the guy, uh, you say John Stevens, oh, who the hell's that? And so, again, they didn't even consider getting their original singer back. They thought, you know, we got to get a, somebody that's at least, you know, as popular as John Karabi. And, and I think they did a good job with uh, Glenn Hughes. But, but again, um, they, they decided kind of, instead of going back to the original singer, let's, let's move on. And I, I think they did a great job because if you check out the album they did with Glenn Hughes, I mean, it, it's different from what they did with Karabi, but it's a killer album. It's one of those albums like, they released, I think, every single song in the new album they did with Glenn. Every single um, tune on that album was released eventually as a single. Nice, nice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can't say anything bad about Glenn. He's just a phenomenal musician and in, singer. And, in fact, uh, uh, now, while we're on the subject... His legacy speaks <laughs> volumes to anybody who hasn't been living under a rock. You know, so, I mean... Uh, you know, n nothing more needs to really be said there, in my opinion. But it's uh, it's it's amazing. Like I said, the the success that happened for Dead Daisies after John joined the band, and it really makes me feel good to see that that John got you know some limelight and some some good mileage out of that. You know, I mean, he played played in that band for uh, looks like about four years. So in fact, you know, probably like he put out several albums with those guys and toured the entire fucking world with them. So. Probably, I would say probably he probably toured more with that with the Dead Daisies and in more locations than he did when he was in Motley Crue. Of course, because Motley Crue was just for one tour, and I think that was like 80, 80 cities. And, and then like um, the other thing, Motley Crue is originally see he was in there like you said five years, and you're like I don't I didn't even realize it was that long. But part of the reason for that is okay, they did the one tour, they did the one album, and then they they initially were going to go in and do another album. And, that, and they started to kind of, that's what um, Generation Swine is. And um, so initially they were going to do that with John. And then um, the management or the record label, somebody came in and told me, you know what, you, this is your choice. You guys are either going to either get back with Vince or we're going to drop you. This was, I think, Elektra Records. And so the, the, the band was kind of forced into, into it. And, and I guess like Tommy, Nikki, oh, you know, to tell John like, Sorry, dude. Um, you know, really got no choice, and um, I, I guess from a financial kind of point, you, you you could see why they would do that. But see, John had written a lot of those tunes that ended up on Generation Swine, and again in this interview that I um, was watching the other day, I seen where he was talking about, you know, the manager Alan Kovac, the Molly Crew manager. He asked me, uh, "Hey, um, John, you mind hanging around for a couple months? We'll pay you. You know, teach Vince how to, you know, since you wrote most of these songs, teach Vince how to." how to sing these songs, you'd kind of be his vocal coach or whatever. And he stuck around for a couple of months and he, um, and I guess, and then I guess initially there was um, a rumor going around at MTV that um, somebody supposedly planted the idea that, hey, um, you know, Vince is back in Motley Crue and they're going to keep John Karabi and he's just going to move over to um, rhythm guitar. And John's like, I do not know where that rumor got started, but it was not with me. Yeah. Yeah, you got to watch the rumor mill, man. Uh, people get carried away with that. But, you know, with the, with the whole Motley Crue thing, you know, it, it's, it's kind of sad, too, to know some of the stories, like we talked about earlier uh, tonight in the show, about the situation in New York at the live show yeah. where uh, the guy ended up spitting on Nikki Six. Uh, he was heckling in the crowd, and he had some some hate signs he was holding up, and he was flicking Nikki Six off every time he walked by, and they were blowing it off, you know, whatever. And then, you know, obviously he crossed the line when he spit on Nikki Six, but it was actually John Karabi that jumped in the crowd and got in the dude's face, and he was sticking up for Nikki. Yeah, yeah. So that that also 
also speaks volumes to his character, what kind of a person John is. He's sticking up for his friends. At the time, Nicky was his friend. Yeah, yeah that's, what, know, he, and, that's um, what he said, yeah. You know, uh, also uh, on a little side trail with the Motley Crue thing, you know, he did a, uh, a couple of songs for Mick Mars' solo album. We talked about this before, I think, a little bit, but uh, the little snippets that uh, are on the internet were really good, you know? Gimme Blood was just... It, it kind of was like a, a, a modern version of uh, Shout at the Devil stuff. Yeah. And it was really, it was really good sounding. And I was, I would really love to hear those tracks that he did. You know, it appears now since then, Mick Mars has gotten another singer and moved on. Uh, and that's, I think, mostly due to contractual. Uh, well, from what I understand, problems. Uh, having Mick Mars work with uh, John Karabi yeah, is kind of a no-no for their contract or whatever, so I don't think that Mick was really given much of a say-so in that, and um, I don't know that to be a fact, but I, that's my opinion, no, yeah. and um, that's why uh, not, nothing more ever surfaced about that, you know, and uh, hopefully someday it'd be nice to hear those songs, because the little snippets we got were really promising, really, really good stuff. Yeah, I can't wait when that album finally comes out, but I think unfortunately it's kind of in limbo right now. Number one, they're they're wait um, they're waiting to um, see what happens with the stadium tour. I guess that's their next um, big thing on their agenda if it ever happens. Yeah. And um, yeah. the other thing, like you said, initially, um, I think um, Mick wanted he, uh, like he's been very complimentary over years of that album they did with John. He says I I love it. I love I love everything Krabi did. And that's part of the reason he wanted him to be on his album. And I guess um, initially, uh, Nicky got wind of it and he kind of told him, uh, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute, you know, when we decided we we're going to put Motley Crue to bed, um, we got a contract, we're never going to do this again, we're never going to do this. And, and if anybody, um, nobody's really allowed to work with any um, ex, ex Motley Crue member unless they get permission of other guys and this and that. And so I, I guess on one hand, they could have given their permission. I don't know why you want to be kind of a, a jerk like that, but so Mick had to kind of, like you said, revamp everything and get a new band in there, and um, it, it, it's kind of a it's kind of a shame. Maybe one day it'll come out as um, on some special album. Who knows? Um, but but yeah, I, I would love to hear those tracks. But you know, um, interestingly enough, if you go to John Karabi's solo show, a thing that I love about what he does, he plays the Molly Crew stuff. He puts the Scream stuff in there. He puts his solo stuff in there. He, he puts Union stuff in there in the set list. Um, everything that you know the dead daisies everything he's done throughout his career if you go to john karabi show you're going to get a little bit of everything and and, and I, I dig that about john you know yeah yeah that's good that's the way it should be and speaking of the the scream and uh vinyl and john said that uh they when they came out with, uh, a while back they came out with a limited pressing uh vinyl for the screen and originally it was 300 copies. Well, that, those first 300 copies sold out in 45 minutes. And then they had to do a second then pressing. They got permission from the label to press, do another pressing of I think like 150 or 200 more copies. And those sold out in 40 minutes. Yeah, in fact, so what's, yeah. That tell, what's that tell you? I'll tell you what it tells me, yeah. that he should do another Scream album. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, and, and, you know, talking about what a down-to-earth guy he is, um, I remember the first time I interviewed him, he was telling me a story about, talking about Glenn Hughes, um, on that Molly Crew album, um, Glenn Hughes um, does some of the background vocals um, on the song Misunderstood, and, um, and I guess Glenn was using a different uh, recording studio in the same facility, and, and they, they invite, hey, you want, hey, Glenn, why don't you come and you can um, do some background vocals on um, one of the songs, and and um, so he said, I got to meet uh, Glenn Hughes. He was a super cool guy. Um, and then the, the other thing is, he was saying that um, in the same studio where they were recording the Motley Crue album, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry come in, in, in there one day. And, um, and you know, he's like, man, I was, a, I, I, I was like the ultimate Aerosmith fan. And I'm meeting these guys for the first time. And Steven T Tyler comes up to me and he's introduced, introduced himself to me. I was just, I was so speechless. I could not even say a word. And then... He says at the same time, um, Stephen tells Nikki, hey, 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 Nikki, man, what's up with your singer? I said hello and you didn't answer me and this and that. He goes, I was just so kind of, um, you know, starstruck. I, I couldn't say anything. Yep. Yep. I'm familiar with that story. 
Yeah, yeah. Also, uh, on the Scream album, the song You Are All I Need, Ray Gillen uh, from Badlands uh, sang backing vocals on that. Did you know that? No, no. That, that, um, I was not aware of it. I'll have to go give that a second listen. And, um, you know, uh, interesting enough about uh, Ray Gillen, of course, we know he was in Badlands. Um, at, at one point, um, you know, that the band Blue Murder, which had uh, Sykes and Carmine Apiece and Tony Franklin... Um, yep. Ray Gillen at one point was was a singer, and then Sykes decided he was going to do the vocals. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. Those are big. Those are mighty big shoes to fill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ray and Ray Gillen was one of those guys. Sadly, died tragically young. I mean, he was, I think, only thirty something when he died. Um, he's been dead like nineteen or uh, twenty years. He died of AIDS, of course. And um, Badlands is kind of a thing he's remembered for. But um, he's one of those guys that kind of just left the world a little too early he, he i guess he made big enough noise you know but um it's it's sad when you think of uh what that guy could have done absolutely absolutely uh funny story about him uh he auditioned uh to be uh the vocalist for ingray malmstein and when he went into the audition they asked him where you know where's where's your press kit uh -huh. and he said i am my press kit you know uh -huh. i don't have a press kit and they kind of laughed him off, and uh, Ingrid didn't want to have nothing to do with him. He thought, you know, how unprofessional. Yeah. And uh, so he's like, well, whatever, fuck yourself, you know? And yeah, he started yeah. walking out, and somebody told him, go get that guy, don't let him leave, he's an amazing singer. And they ran back there to try and go get him to come back in, uh -huh. and he told them, I wasn't good enough for you five minutes ago, I'm not good enough for you now. Wow, wow. <laughs> I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah, that takes so Ray, balls. Ray, yeah. Basically told, Ray basically told Ingve to fuck off. Wow, wow. <laughs> so, and uh, of course he ended up hooking up with Jakey e. Lee and the, the rest is history. But uh, that's a pretty uh, interesting little, little side note story. But um, getting back to John Karabi, uh, the 2010 album that Rap put out, which I really liked, was called Infestation. And he gets a writing credit on that. I did not know that he was part of the writing team of that album. Well, I, I, yeah, um, what, what's amazing is that um, that's the album that features um, Carlos Cavazos. See, I, um, right before they went in to record that album, John had left Rat, and that's the point when Carlos Cavazos comes in. And the single off of that album is, is called The Best of Me. There's a music video. Pretty cool video. But, but anyways, um, Carlos wrote uh, with a co-writer on that, but... Um, but yeah, I guess um, John had con uh, contributed some stuff, um, you know, for, for a rap because um, they were going to maybe make an album. But um, once they did that album, <laughs> Stephen was back in the band, and so um, that's how that happened. I guess um, he contributed one of those songs before he left the band, and they had some stuff that they had worked on. But um, pretty cool st still to um, to have your um, you know one of your songs on a rap album. In fact. Um, one of the guys that plays in Stephen Piercy's solo band, um, I, I, I uh, seen an interview he did recently, and he's talking about that he was a co-writer, I, I think, uh, think on um, one of those uh, the early Rat songs, like on the, the uh, first album, the album that was Round and Round, Alba Seller. And he's like, I was reminding Stephen that, you know, that I, I, uh, I wrote a part of that song, you know, like years later. And he's like, oh, don't worry about it, man. He goes, I'll, I'll make sure you get the... Uh, the, you know the credit, and he's like, it's years later, but okay, that that's pretty cool that he was, you know, willing to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But getting back to his book, I wanted to say uh, a minute, for a minute, talk about. Uh, it says on his website, he recounts his life from the mean streets of Philadelphia to the Sunset Strip. Take a look at the behind scenes at Karabi's time fronting Motley Crue, Union, and the Dead Daisies, as well as his time playing rhythm guitar with Rat, and even his stint as a long haul trucker. Whether it's detailing his parents' difficult divorce, his family's dark history of abuse, his run in with a serial killer, or simply the best way to arrive at a wedding, which maybe is by helicopter and maybe it isn't. Yeah. He pulls no punches and outlines the good, the bad, and all of his autobiography. So it looks like this would be uh, a very interesting read, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'll probably try and get it uh, as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a, get the copies while they last. Like I said, the the, the vinyl thing that he put, they put on his website, he sold out in 45 minutes. See that, that I seen that. I was like wondering, oh, vinyl. Oh, that, that's that's a cool thing. But see, 
what I dig about stuff like that is um, it's given your fans a little, a little something extra, a little more than what they maybe were expecting. You know, initially, um, oh, okay, that's cool. John's putting out a book, but but again, um, it's a little something extra to go with the book. You know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it. Uh, and, and you know, it's really interesting to me, at least. And you know, it's interesting. I think I'm looking forward to the book. I mean, this is really the complete John Karabi story. What I mean by that is. He wrote a couple chapters, you know, even in Motley Crue's um, book, The Dirt, from, you know, his time in the band. But I think also in that same interview we were talking about, Joe, that we saw, um, he talks about, like, how Motley Crue kind of, they, they, they colored, like, some of that stuff. Like, he, he was talking about something about he he was with a Japanese girl or something when they toured Japan. And he's like, um, you know, when they edited the book, somebody said they, they wanted to make it sound kind of... Um, Kind of spicy, so they, oh, Kar- Kar- you know, Karabi was hanging out with five, five girls in Japan, you know, backstage in Japan, and he like it wasn't really like that. He goes, they they were just kind of trying to spice it up. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of what they did with the Dirt movie. I mean, um, I initially when I saw that movie, I I, I initially thought they're going to kind of um, not even mention the fact that Karabi was ever in the band, but there's a point in the movie where it's you know they kind of for five seconds camera goes over on this guy and it's it's obvious he's supposed to be John Karabi looks a little like him but um and then and then there's a part of a movie where um we're supposed to see there's like only uh, supposedly eight guy you know uh, eight fans in the arena you know Molly Cruz playing to you know such poor poor audiences and stuff and he's like I don't know what their point was in putting that in the movie um but it's like why yeah well you know are the facts yeah. and uh, people didn't support the album and the funny thing is is now years later there's this huge uh, commotion around this Motley Crue album you know in 94 where was all this fucking support yeah in fact what's you funny know, everybody hated it back then you know because you know I think that a band like Motley Crue had such a distinct sound that fans expected it to be a certain thing and when it, when it wasn't you know, uh, they kind of, uh, it, it was very, very, very split. And a lot of people didn't support it. Well, that means people didn't go to the concerts either. So, yeah, the concert attendance was definitely not what they were used to as Motley Crue. Yeah. So, you know, some of those things uh, maybe were exaggerated, but uh, they weren't taken out of context too much. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's not a dig at John. That's just, that's just, what, that's just what happened. Yeah, what's it? Yeah. Tell you that too, I think. And what's interesting about you know? the, the point you just made is, like you're saying, okay, um, as we were talking about, you know, prepping for a show the other day, John, uh, Joe. Um, it, it, this Molly Crew album came out in '94. You know, in a um, couple of years, in 2024, that album's going to be 30 years old, if you can even believe that. And um, what's interesting, like you said, a lot more of the fans have come to love that album. I mean, um, like I said. Um, and so much to the point that John Karabi, uh, the latest solo album put out is this live album. It's called One Night in Nashville Live. And it's him playing that entire Motley Crue album. And what you get is it, it is a different sound because it's um, the tracks are all live. And it, it's John doing it live in concert. Um, and so it is a little something. And then you get a, um, you get a couple of bonus tunes. Um, not, nothing really new, but... Um, it, it, it's it's a great kind of um, live concert experience of that, and um, and I think that's a cool thing that he did for the um, fans. But but like you're saying, this life is uh, the album has has had a, a kind of a pick up in the popularity of whatever you want to say. I mean, more fans love that album now, maybe than when it initially came out because they've had I think a lot, you know, a lot uh, many more years to kind of live with it. take a while to grow on people and for people to accept things and you know not only that I think you know it's it, there's no way to hide it there's no there's no secret anymore I mean um, Vince Neil is horrible live yeah yeah and he's been horrible live most of his career um, he's very much a studio singer and uh, that he fix up his vocals and with the tools and auto tune and all kinds of various effects and different things uh, to to get his voice to sound the way it does. And um, 
Well, and, and you know, the, he's, not that, he's yeah. not that good of a live singer, and I can I can say that uh, I can say that right to his face. I'll challenge Vince Neil to sing any Motley Crue song that he wants. I against yeah. him, and I'll blow his fucking doors off. And I think part of that and, is, and even 25, 30 years ago, yeah. he wasn't that good. He, he was never a good live singer. And when, what they had with John, John was not only a good live singer. John was a songwriter, a guitar player. I mean, John was a true musician. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind, of a, kind of a poser, you know. He just he was up there shaking his ass and waving around his blonde hair and had a uh, nasally, well, kind of crazy voice and. It fit, it worked. You know, when he was younger, yeah, he had some fire in him, man, and uh, those early recordings definitely show that. Yeah. You know, and um, they didn't have some of the effects and stuff that they have, the tricks that they have uh, back in the late 70s and early 80s, and, you know, it was a lot harder to do, at least. So, um, you know, and it's getting more obvious and more apparent and well, more fans are seeing that you know Vince, Vince has had some very very disappointing live shows and they're all over the internet well yeah and I so think people are seeing this and they're hearing it and they're like good God, what the fuck is this guy doing in fact you, you know, know he's so, almost becoming you know, that doesn't help Vince and that doesn't yeah. help Motley Crue in fact, but, he, he uh, yeah. you know, so then of course, you know, then you start hearing rumors about John Karabi coming back, and he squashed those rumors. You know, he's went he's went online saying, you know, that this that's not true, it's not happening. He's like, even if they he ask me, call for the clickbait. Yeah, and he, yeah, and, he went on uh, to say like he has no intentions whatsoever of returning to Motley Crue. And he, I, don't, I don't see that happening, and honestly, I hope it doesn't happen because they treated him and talked to, talked about him like shit. In fact, he's better than that. In fact, uh, that's why I was getting ready to say I have a lot. I have a huge amount of respect for Karabi just for that because he said, you know, even, Nikki could ask me today, hey John, you know, Vince isn't working out, come back. He he would not do it. I mean, and and, and I kind of believe that. I think a huge part, like you said, because of some of the things they've said, especially Nikki, um, and, and, and like some of the stuff that was said, and 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 I, and I can understand why you wouldn't want to go back to that. It's like, oh well, you know. You, yeah. I he keeps going on with the solo stuff and like I said you know uh, from an old school fan that's been that knew who John was before his time in Motley Crue I hope that he goes back and somehow pulls another Scream album out I think that would be fucking awesome if he did that yeah, you know just yeah. don't even say anything to nobody just get together with these guys and do it all in, in private and quiet and then just bam all, all at one time here it is a new Scream album yeah I, 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 I will I will say in regards to Vince Neil, um, I seen Motley Crue when they did that tour with Kiss, um, maybe about ten or fifteen years ago, and live, you know, then he was kind of in shape still, and he, he he did an all right job, you know, when they did that tour. But I think, you know, besides obvious uh, weight gain and, and health issues there, I think a lot of what's going on with his voice, like you said, maybe he was never the greatest singer, but I think there was a time when he was able to do a decent job. But but now besides the weight gain and all that, I think you also got all these years of um, heavy drinking, drinking and, and drug abuse. And, and they, they, yeah, they, they, he, he destroyed his voice with uh, cocaine and things like that, and you can hear it. And there's rumors that you know going around besides the weight and stuff, and about the way he's singing live, that um, he is so, so become such a heavy drinker. I mean, even even right now as we speak, that um, it's starting to really affect his health. And you know, there's talk that you know. He may not be in the greatest health, so hope that's not true. But yeah, it's... hopefully the guy gets it together, man. I don't wish any ill on no, him no, or anything no. like that. You know, I love him. I love Motley Crue. You know, but uh, it is what it is. He's and, becoming uh, a he's becoming you know, a liability. Change times yeah. change, and uh, hopefully, hopefully he pulls it together and is able to uh, continue on in a positive way. You know, doing whatever it is. And uh, same thing with John Karabi, but I think a, a good a good way to end this is if you're all right with it. Yeah. Uh, we did this interview yeah, yesterday. Go, no, actually, and we're really recording it. But the reason why I'm bringing this up yeah. uh, and letting people know this is because that's what metalheads do. We refrain from restrain. We refuse to lose. And we get back up, we dust ourselves off, and we do it again. No, yeah, in fact, is metal. in fact, it's, it's hilarious because um, just to tell people exactly what Joe's talking about, it was maybe two nights ago we did this initially, and um, we did a great episode, kind of like we did tonight, talking about John Karabi, something we, me and Joe have been talking about doing. And um, uh, the very next day, I go to download on the show we recorded into my computer, and something falls on the recording device from my desk, and it erases the show that's in the device, 
And I'm like, oh my God, Joe, we got to totally redo the show. But I think it came out even um, even better because we, um, you know, and the other thing I guess we'll end on is this, Joe. Um, Vince Neil and everything we've been talking about, he's becoming like a real liability for uh, Motley Crue. I mean, here's the thing. They're in a really unique position, okay? I mean, if Nikki had been kind of different, maybe, you know, um, you know, maybe it gets to the point where Vince can't do the stadium tour. You know, if he would have been a little more cool, maybe Karabi would have been willing to come back. But they're, they're now the position, what? So if Vince Neal doesn't, is not in shape, you, you're in the position of either canceling the entire tour. Because, you know, if Karabi doesn't do it, what, what are you going to, you going to get another lead singer? I, I don't think the fans would really go for that. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to it's, it's hard to say what they would do. I mean, in all honesty, I don't think Bradley Cruz hurting for money. I no, don't think no, that they would have to do another thing ever again. No, for but the rest of their lives. But here's a, they would be just fine if they manage their money right. Yeah, oh, but John, yeah. on the other hand, is not in that situation, and he has to continue touring and writing and recording to uh, make a living. Yeah, and in fact, you know, and I bring that up because not so much. I'm, I'm sure Molly Crew would be fine, but. You know, all those other bands, you know, Motley Crue, Def Leppard, Poison, Joan Jett, um, they've been postponing this tour for the last two and a half years, almost three years now. And Nikki still says, oh, yeah, they're going to do it. And they want to celebrate, you know, 40, 41 years of Motley Crue. And, and, it's, and then I'm talking from a fan's point, point of view. You know, fans have been kind of waiting this. Could you imagine, oh, you know, we, we paid money. And they got to get all our money back and this and that. And how, how disappointing it will be for the fans. But that's life. And, and perfect place to wrap this up tonight, Joe, is, um, after all, we're talking about um, the things Nikki said about John over the years about how he had to, it's painful to, you know, write that Molly Crew album because he had to teach John Karabi how to write tunes. Um, I was reading something online today where um, Nikki came out today and he's like, he regrets firing Karabi from Motley Crew. Wow! Oh, of course he's gonna say that because things ain't working out with Vince now. Yeah, yeah. So now we're gonna kiss John's ass and I hope John doesn't fall for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. Um, we can we can talk again about Karabi when the book comes out. But another great episode in the Kanjo, and this one um, I'm gonna put it somewhere safe so it does not get erased. You have my word on that, buddy. Stick it in the stick it in the vault for safekeeping. Yeah, I, I will do that. And, and in fact, just to let the people know, next uh, week when uh, Joe and I get together, we're gonna be doing something a little different. We're gonna have an episode on. Um, K.K.'s Priest, that's of course a new band featuring uh, K.K. Downing and Tim Owens from Judas Priest. And what's so, a little different is um, typically we, we talk about our favorite classic kind of old school bands. And this first time we'll be talking about a newer band, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun. Me too. Okay, Joe, thanks for doing this. Uh, go and get some rest because I know you have to go to work tomorrow. All right. You, you too. Have a good night. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Chaotic Riffs Magazine.